November 2014, the Canadian government <coughs> unveiled a mock-up of a future memorial to the victims of communism to be built in Ottawa, just west of the Parliament buildings. Taking the form of a giant sandfold triangle with over 100 million singular pixel-like memory squares covering the exterior face of the poles, each representing an individual victim, the monument was um, very quickly criticized by a number of people. The mayor of Ottawa and the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, for instance, claimed that the location of such a non-neutral monument right next to the Supreme Court, which is obviously supposed to embody a certain neutrality, um, is at best, um, uh, uh, is plainly inappropriate. Academics and professors have said on a slightly different note that the very concept of victims um, of communism is way too vague. And the organization behind the monument, of which many members are very close to the federal government, um, insisted that it will, quote, serve as a public reminder of the millions of victims of communism and will bring the suffering of these victims into the public's consciousness, end quote. Um, I'm bringing this uh, example of the, the Ottawa Memorial uh, because in many ways it is paradigmatic of how conventional monuments and memorials operate, that is, it, within various forms of network. Um, positioned at the juncture of the past and the future, they attempt to conjugate the often conflictual desiderata of providing narratives of the past and ensuring the pertinence and acceptance of those narratives among future generations. Monuments and memorials are also situated at the nexus between political bodies, which have traditionally commissioned those edifices, and the general public. As they exist between elites and peoples, monuments have continuously proved choice sites for social unrest and political discord. Monumental space is, in other words, inherently nodal and has traditionally functioned as a site where ideological pressures, conflict with norms of social behavior, and emotional individual responses to the object, object of commemoration. In recent years, a number of artists and architects, including Thomas Hirschhorn, Thomas Schütze, Christopher Dischko, and Maya Lin, have revisited these dynamics in order to develop models of monumentality that activate the constructive potential of these tensions. Although I can only dwell very briefly on one of these artists today, uh, in this case, Thomas Hirschhorn, they all partake in a certain collection of strategies, conceiving the monument as an event, encouraging public discussion or reflection and social interactions, or emphasizing the collaborative or communal aspect of the work, to name only a few. Moreover, what um, Hirschhorn and his peers have in common is the desire to support a particular conception of the public role of art, namely to critique our current use of public space as a mere space of transit, a space that has become purely instrumental to our fulfilling everyday tasks. Hirschhorn's Gramsci Monument is the fourth and final work in his monument series, works in public space focused on the ideas of Baruch Spinoza, Gilles Deleuze, Georges Bataille, and Antonio Gramsci. The monument was built in the form of an outdoor pavilion during the summer of 2013 in the Bronx in New York City and dismantled a few months later. Upon completion, the Gramsci Monument was by far the largest of the four monuments and integrated the widest range of functional spaces, a radio station, a newspaper office, a library, a gallery, a workshop art studio, a computer lab, a lounge, a cafe, and an open air theater. Her short series of monuments is first and foremost a critique of traditional models of monumentality, which he described as quote, an incitement to admire the dominant ideology, end quote. Traditional monuments, as I have briefly alluded to um, just now, single out specific past moments for commemorative or narrative purposes. In this process, which originates from political bodies, temporality is not left untouched, so to speak. Public monuments manipulate or construct a certain temporality in accordance with their aims. They attribute historical and cultural value to a pre-selected past, 
presenting it as worthy of being kept alive in the consciousness of future generations. Hirshhorn, on the other hand, insists that his monuments do not emerge from or serve as an extension of the elite political body. Rather, they originate from and are placed under the full responsibility of their initiator. Moreover, the thoughts they provoke and the feelings they evoke are unconstrained, which challenges the purported immutability or atemporality of traditional monumental narratives. Rather than instructing visitors as to acceptable ways of reading their society's past, Hirshhorn's temporary monuments are prompts for ongoing reflection. And what am I going to do? What I'm doing right now here in front of you is just perpetuating the monument in a way. But Hirshhorn's model of monumentality is not simply a critique of traditional monuments. And indeed, and this is what I will focus on hereafter, Hirshhorn's model is integral to his critique of public space. It is deployed within that space and yet is an invitation to rethink it or engage with it critically. As Hirshhorn has written, the monuments are spaces aside, or spaces within a space. The monuments, I submit, invite us to rethink two basic premises of the current workings of space, social time and social encounters. In a face-to-face -face conversation with the artist in May 2014, Hirshhorn emphasized to me his desire to come to grips with the current temporality of public space. In general, he noticed public space is used as a mere space of transit, one that, as I mentioned, becomes instrumental to our going somewhere or fulfilling some further end of ours. The time spent in public space is often seen as lost or fruitless, while the time devoted to work or the home is regarded as truly productive or valuable. Most of us, it seems, live according to social standards of speed and performance, standards that not only give shape to our expectations of time's flow, but also affect our perception and use of the space we live in. If that's true, then how does the space produced by Hirshhorn subvert or rethink that logic? Where or when does the monument's critical distance come to play? Hirshhorn illustrated this subversion through the example of strikes and demonstrations, events where individuals mobilize public space for political purposes and take the time to occupy, reclaim, or transform this space. The monuments generate something similar. Not only do they invite their visitors to reduce the tempo of their daily life, to take the time to read a book or hear a lecture, they also, by the same token, interrupt the passivity and instrumentalization of public space and turn it into a more productive environment. The monuments reassert the importance of creating accessible physical and temporal stopping points where one can think, discuss, argue, and learn. Alongside the goal of producing sites that challenge the temporal logic of public space, that is, of creating a productive public space in which it is worth spending time, one we transit to, first one aimed to transform this space into something socially productive or bonding. In Hirshhorn's view, the event is not only the triggering of a reflection I've mentioned earlier, but also the production of something inherently social. Little wonder then that he opens one of his statements regarding the Bataille Monument, which was built in 2003 uh, for Documenta 11 in Kassel, with the following question, am I able to initiate encounters through my work? And he was, even weeks before his monument took physical shape. Hirshhorn's postscript to the Bataille Monument begins with an account of his first meeting with his soon-to-be friends Alain Dannenberg, a Kassel social worker, Lothar Kannenberg, the initiator of a nearby boxing camp, and Christophe Fiat, a French writer with whom he explored the work of Bataille. Likewise, the Gramsci Monument archival website abounds in photographic witnesses of Hirshhorn's encounters with local supervisors and administrators and of encounters between local people themselves. In all stages of the project thereafter, from their construction to their dismantling through their use and occupancy, Hirshhorn never lost track of his social objective. In lieu of facing an impersonal, impermeable structure, quote, the inhabitants are the ones who are helping the monuments to be carried out to completion, end quote. As such, Hirshhorn's monument convey the idea that public space can be something other than a facade. As um, Marianne Dodzema suggests, the monument has a responsibility apart from its qualities as a work of art. 
It is a work of art created for the public and therefore can and should be evaluated in terms of its capacity to generate human reactions, end quote. Hirschhorn was able to initiate encounters through his work, therefore offering a view of public space as socially generative. In his book, Postmodern Geographies, Edward Soja builds up on Henri Lefebvre's claim that, quote, space and the political organization of space express social relationships, but also react back upon them. This dual relationship is what Soja has, called, has described as, quote, the social-spatial dialectic, that social and spatial relations are dialectically interreactive, interdependent, that social relations of production are both space-forming and space-contingent. It's not then simply that space is socially produced, but also that social relations are spatially it is precisely the critical potential of this socio-spatial dialectic, the capacity to generate different, productive, and loving social relations and temporal models through space that Hirschhorn's model of monumentality seizes and exploits. The monuments are invitations to reconceive the public space we live in in ways that activate the constructive potential of social presence and interaction. Despite what this model might achieve, I want to devote these final minutes to exploring its limitations. One of those limitations comes into relief with the observation that Hirschhorn works within a certain socioeconomic system, one that exercises an overwhelming purchase on any attempt to question it. How, one might ask, can one create something different or dissident within all-encompassing capitalism? In such a context, it seems that any effort to insert political critique into the, into the socio-economic landscape will either be relegated to the realm of the utopian or absorbed by the system as a sign of capitalism's capacity to accommodate even its fiercest adversaries. One way to address this concern is to insist, as Hirschhorn does, on the necessity and unavoidability of operating from within this system, of creating a space within a space, it's true that Hirschhorn's monuments might not be able to negate the system as a whole, it would be absurd in fact to burden anyone with such a task. They nevertheless succeed, even if on a small scale, in rethinking and physically remodeling one of the system's fundamental constituents, public space. At the same time, even though spatial practices, including Hirschhorn's, do possess the potential to bring about tangible social change and critical reflection on the context in which they operate, their political ambit has its own limits. In particular, I would emphasize the naivete of any disregard for the fact that the creation of a just and productive public space requires the support of paraspatial interventions. Hirschhorn does create alternative, productive, valuable public spaces, but without broader social, political, and legal measures, the dream of the total remodeling of that space remains elusive. This is not only to envision that your works by Hirschhorn might have to interface more directly with the powers that regulate the spaces they enter. My suggestion is also an appeal to these powers, a call for the public realization that the space in which we live, the space of activists and strikers, of students and workers, of politicians, politicians and revolutionaries, is more than a collection of parks and stone sculptures. Public space is where we learn, protest, and negotiate, where we meet, reflect, and remember. As Lefebvre once proclaimed in a tone that anticipates Hirschhorn's own passion, quote, change life, change society, these precepts mean nothing without the production of an appropriate space.